end of display was chosen in the cases that a modern painter, here Manet, here Cezanne, or more than one, were directly inspired by a certain work by El Greco. In those cases, they appeared as a couple or a trio. Along the way, the visitor could appreciate of how the sequence Manet, Cezanne, Picasso was articulated on the very basis of the different approaches of, to the paintings of El Greco. Picasso was the core of this part of the exhibition. Through the different phases of his painting, the art of El Greco was present as a ubiquitous reference interpreted in different ways. There was also a secondary room separated from the axis dedicated to the Spanish painters such as Zuloaga, Sorolla, who were also influenced by the master. After Picasso, who occupied the center line with Cezanne, there were the Czech cubism, the Orphis, Modigliani, their Blauer writer. At this point, circa 1910, El Greco was discovered by many artists of the European and immediately of the American avant-garde. For the second room, the sequential plan of the first room had to be transformed into a different display that would be able to explain the almost simultaneous movements of German Expressionism, French School of Paris included Surrealism and American painting. From Demuth to the first Pollock. Another space had to be added to these three ones to show the movements following the devastation of the Second World War. Those four circuits were defined with the help of four walls built to have the four columns and to present the most impressive works by El Greco. Those four walls were turned 45 degrees with respect to the walls of the room and circumscribed the square of the skylight in the very center of the room. The display represented this open ascending space as a metaphor of the inspiration. The four panels were occupied by the baptism of Christ, the Laocon, the National Gallery of Washington, the vision of St. John, the Metropolitan, and the resurrection in the Prado. Those four paintings surrounded the void and clear space under the skylight in the very center of this room of 400 square meters, the visitor could turn round and contemplate in a panoramic view, not only those huge works by El Greco, but also the paintings by Steinhardt, Kokoska in the first room, Rivera, Chagall in the second room, and uh, Demuth and Pollock in the third room, Bacon and Saura in the last room. So this display allowed an experience of simultaneity in the perception of the late powerful Grecos and of the painting influenced by them in different movements, cultures and geographies in Europe and America. The visitor could will in those four circuits and after each one return, he returned to the center and recovered the reference to Greco's paintings 
a sense of totality was provided by such a geometrical disposition around the skylight designed by Rafael Monet. Thanks. Thank you, um, Dr. Javier. Uh, I, that was a very elaborate presentation on how um, you have designed with the masters themselves. Uh, I will now request uh, Dr. Uh, Deborah Tiakrajan to give her presentation. And we will take all the questions at the end after the four panelists have presented. And thank you for keeping your time also. Thanks. Okay. So. Okay. Am I doing it right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Please share. Okay. Good. Well, yeah, thank you, Shika and uh, Alka, for inviting me to the panel. Um, as we said, the Dakshin Chitra Museum is an historical regional museum. Uh, it has as its core exhibitions, it has 18 historical houses, which we buy and which we bought, they were going to be demolished and we reconstruct them at Dakshin Chitra. There are uh, two here um, and to show you just to show you the different types of houses we have. And then we have a large collection of everyday artifacts, ritual and religious items, textiles, paintings and uh, prints and some tribal art and, and paintings also. So we are not the grand classical museum, but we are a niche museum to, to give an historical background to what has been happening in South India. And we represent the arts, the architecture, vernacular architecture and the arts of the four Southern states of India. Now we're a young museum. We opened only 24 years ago and we are a one hour drive to the south of Chennai city. So when people come out to Dakshin Chitra, they expect to spend a half a day or three quarters of a day at the museum to make their journey worthwhile. So how do we um, work with, with that to give them an experience? So I thought today I would talk to, about how do we make museums relevant today and how do we bring in more young people to museums? Last year before COVID, we had 250,000 visitors. Now, when we opened in 1996, we found that people don't want to just look, they want to do. So we organized 18 different handcraft activities that anybody could do at the museum uh, for a very small amount of money. And uh, that would be like um, uh, pottery, uh, weaving a small basket, uh, block printing, column drawing, even traditional grinding, things like that. So they tur turned out to be very popular and we trained our housekeepers to do that. Then we opened a craft bazaar um, and we have about 20 craftsmen every day and we use them, they're, they're, they're all wonderful craftspeople and we use them as resource people for our workshops and we have many workshops in craft for both children and adults. And we're trying to sensitize the local population and people to the aesthetics of the South. So um, another part of the uh, life of uh, rural India and traditional India are the folk performing arts. Now the South is very, very rich in folk performing arts. And uh, from Karnataka alone, we brought into over 25 different troops. Now these troops are generally not known because they are regional they are usually ritually oriented and very often by one community or for one community. So we bring them on a larger platform. And a lot of the handcrafts actually revolve around the folk performing arts. And uh, they also inspire a lot of the arts and aesthetics within the city. So in order to continually bring in these arts, we have nine different festivals, which we use as an anchor and we do different events at the same time. Now, as I said, the core, the core of our museum are the houses and the exhibitions, and we have both object and contextual exhibitions. When we do, context, when, when we do object exhibitions like this Vahana ex exhibit, which a Vahana is the vehicle on which the God goes around the, the temple, circumambulates the temple, then we always do a video which shows how it's used because people don't look at these objects as objects for aesthetic reasons. They look at them as a matter of faith. So in a sense, we're sensitizing people to their own aesthetics. Uh, we, um, in our 
there's another one of our exhibitions. We, we have many exhibitions in each house. They're either in con context or object exhibitions. This is actually a contextual exhibition. Um, it's a, a merchant house and you enter through the small room that you see in the back, which has all the elements of the dowry that were dowries which were given at the beginning of the 20th century. And in this room, which is mirrors all on the wall, ceiling and floor, all the items that a young woman would have used in her life in the early uh, 20th century. So whenever we do uh, exhibitions in the houses, we also talk about the communities that lived in these houses. And our houses are basically prototypes of architectural styles, which are, are found in the, uh, different regions in the South. They're not one of a kind, they're, 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 they're actual prototypes. So um, we have videos where we, um, people from the community talk about what their architecture and their arts mean to them and how they feel about the, the present and the future. We even have a video on the cuisine of one of the, of the, com the com communities. We could do much more with, with food. <laughs> and um, we, we do different events. So strangely in the South, only about 5% of the people speak English. Um, much of what goes on in, in uh, the arts, whether it's music or, or um, uh, visual arts is in English. So we, we concentrate also on, uh, we have language festivals where we concentrate on the language. Uh, we reach out into the community by here, we had a, a Tamil festival where we asked them to uh, do a graphic on, on um, Tamil fonts. We gave them four words and we got a large response from the community. You can see some of them being put up and uh, we had a competition for um, banners in, in Tamil. You can see one being drawn and basically we're a platform for creativity and uh, we, with this Langfest, we um, look at, we look at uh, uh, Tamil as it's used in theater, as it's used in cinema, in literature, in poetry. And we have, we kind of get different crowds when we do things in Tamil from when we do in, them in English. This is a theater performance by Kalairani. And uh, um, uh, anyway, it's, it's, been a, it's been a very good experience. So this coming weekend on um, Saturday and Sunday, we have another festival because we punctuate always the, the uh, events at Dakshina Chitra so that people feel there's always something happening and there's always something new. And um, here we have, we, have, we have on Saturday, we have uh, a whole, we have three major online international sessions one on audience development, one on innovation in the arts, and one on will money solve all your problems, and a networking platform. Then we have a major performance of Yakshagana. And the next day, besides panel discussions and all, we have for adolescents, we have brought, we're bringing in, this is on Sunday, we're bringing in a man who is the, we call the king of Tamil memes. He has over a million followers. This is to bring in younger people, different people. And we also are bringing in a young woman with her troupe who does reel. Reel is a 60 second dance, um, which is very, you know, all over TikTok and all the other channels. And these are these, and we do different activities in the houses also. So with reel and meme, we're trying to reach out to different segments of the population and bring them in. And one thing we found very um, exciting is we have once a month, we have open mic, which we'll have on Sunday also, where we have to register, but anyone who's composed poetry, who has um, written songs, who's composed music, and they want to perform it, we have a platform for them to perform. That again has brought in a very different crowd of people. So what we do is we're looking, even though the core of what the museum does is our houses and our exhibitions, um, and we also have seminars and we're also putting things online on YouTube. Um, still, we find that unless we do that ho holistic um, dynamic uh, programs, then we, we will miss out on many parts of the audience. We still need more audience to come, but um, we, we hope that we will, through these activities, stay relevant as we also refine our exhibitions and, and do more with, with the exhibitions. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Devarati Agarajan. That was uh, very interesting. And also uh, we made the shift, you know, the, from Dr. Javier, Dr. Javier's uh, presentation on the masters, uh, museum for the masters to a museum, which is uh, for the local cultures. And now I will request our third panelist, uh, Mrs. Kamini Sawney to introduce the museum map. Thank you so much, Shika. And let me begin by saying congratulations to the organizers of this Biennale that actually made it a reality despite all the odds. And thank you to Alkaji for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to present MAP to all of you today. So let me jump right in. Okay, so MAP is a new museum that's coming up in the city of Bengaluru in South India. And our mission is really to take art into the heart of the community and try and establish a museum going culture in the country because our cities are crowded, but our museums sadly are empty, except perhaps I think for the Victoria Memorial in Calcutta and the CSMBS in Bombay, most people don't find museums exciting places to be in. So we hope to really change all that. So this is where we are located in the heart of the city on an arterial road opposite a beautiful park. There are three government museums opposite us. We are close to two metro stations and we realize the importance of location if we want to be accessible to people. So that is an artistic rendering of map. That's how it'll look when it's ready. And we hope to see that map becomes a place not just for objects, but a space for ideas and conversations that we initiate through the collection. The collection becomes a catalyst to start this conversation with people because we want this to be an exciting cultural hub where people come to learn something and enjoy the whole experience. So the idea is to provide a new experience to everyone. This is, the, this is where we are at now and um, the, mu the building is expected to be ready by September and we hope to open at the end of this year. So how do we create this new experience for people? And as always, the starting point has to be the collection that we have. And um, MAP has quite a wide ranging collection. If you look at it, we have six categories in the collection with pre-modern, modern and contemporary, folk and tribal, textile craft and design, popular culture. We're one of the few, if not the only museum in the country that has popular culture as an integral part of the collection. So the idea is to try and collapse these hierarchies between what is perceived as high and low art and not to look at the collection in silos, but to look horizontally across and draw connections. And, and that's the way we hope that people from all different backgrounds, different religions, different communities, all find some part of their life reflected in this space and they're able then to connect. And that's why inclusion and accessibility is really a huge, I, I call them the two pillars of MAP um, because we hope that this will be accessible to people not only with physical but also with mental disability. And that's why our architects have sat down from the very beginning with our consultants from DOC, which is a diversity and equal opportunities center to try and see how do we make map, first of all, accessible in a physical sense. We have the ramps, we have the, we have the toilets that are accessible to people with disability, but what are the kind of surfaces we use, for example, on our lifts? What are the kind of lights we use? So, this, so they do not disturb people with certain mental conditions. Um, we're also talking about um, um, we're also talking about our website where we also try to see that this is accessible to people either with visual disabilities or people um, with certain hearing conditions. So, um, for example, we have now all our programming online has um, Indian Sign Language interpretation and subtitles, but the website also in terms of the color contrast that we use, the kind of fonts that we have, we have also introduced all text so that very often screen readers for people with visual disability will, will tell you what, what, uh, the, about the text that is available, but they will not tell you about the images. So all text also describes the images that are available to you on the website. So it's a holistic experience for the person. So this I thought was a, a nice example of our message of inclusion. Um, the, this is a, a work that we commissioned by the Arvani project that was to cover the shuttering at the map building site. It was a call out to the city to tell them we're, we're a new museum coming up there. We love the work that the Aravani Art Collective does. They're a collective. 
uh, which provides uh, of, of trans of trans women, and they try to provide a platform for the community um, to link in with the rest of the city through art. And so we asked them to do this story of Bangalore, which was a tribute to the city and this vibrant city with its different communities that are all here. You can see the Pura Karmikas who did a wonderful job. During the pandemic, you can see the iconic policeman there with his Stetson, the children in the park. This was a garden city. Uh, someone with a disability in his wheelchair. So everyone has a space in this mural. So I thought it would be interesting to tell you about how we decided to launch our digital museum because when the pandemic hit, like everybody else, we were utterly shocked because we had so far been focused on the roadmap to the opening of the physical museum. And so we took all our programming online but then when we sat down in brainstorming sessions to see what is the future, the constant message we were talking to our board members, to our advisory council members, and the message that we were getting back was, why are you so fixated on a physical museum? Why don't you look at launching a digital museum? Because that really is where the conversation is. And so the whole team sat down and thought about it and said, yeah, let's do this. And so within four months, we had about four months to December 5th when we launched the digital museum of MAP. We launched it with an opening event, and uh, that was followed by a week-long festival called Art is Life, where we introduced the collection to people. We introduced MAP, actually, to people. We decided that if, if the world couldn't come to us, and we had to take MAP to them. So you could access the museum from your home. The festival itself uh, was themed around the interconnectedness between the arts and how each, whether it's literature, it's dance, it's performance, how each is, is enriched by the other. In India, you will very rarely see people just do one, one discipline. It will always, always be performance where you sing, you dance, the Patwa painters draw their scrolls as well. So it's all very interconnected. And then we created a whole series of exhibitions. We opened with three exhibitions, which were conceived as digital entities. So it was important to actually think of not just transport and exhibition that's conceived in a physical space, but to think of what are the tools that the digital platform provides us? And so how do we use them to enhance the experience? And um, we opened with Buribai, of course, and we were very fortunate that very soon after the exhibition opened, she was given the Padma Shri. So that was very nice. Um, some of our team members went to uh, Bhopal to talk to Buribai, and we had hours of audio conversations that we recorded with her. And we decided that in this exhibition, we would like her voice and her thoughts to direct the curatorial narrative rather than have the museum voice, you know, dictate the whole narrative. So um, that was uh, Buribai, who is a Beel artist. And uh, we also, our next exhibition featured uh, a photography collection, which is very significant in MAP, where we featured Suresh Punjabi, a small town photographer who did some amazing work and a film accompanied that so because the space, for and for the, the third exhibition, which we've just changed, which was the first changeover we change every month now, uh, was an exhibition on Zoya Siddiqui, where we actually used the tools that the digital museum really makes it easy to, for example, audio and video. The whole narrative of the exhibition played out using these, these tools. And, and the digital uh, platform lends itself to this kind of an experience. When the pandemic hit, I think education was probably the most affected because we already rolled out our education programming. We were running workshops for children. And so um, we first, uh, it, it was quite difficult for the team actually to turn around and, 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 and take all their programming online, but they did that. We, dis we created the Discover Map series, which was actually learning packs which were downloadable for the comfort of their home, which children could work on with their families. And then slowly when all this, we reached out to the schools that we had initially been interacting with, and by then everyone was sort of getting their act together and, and dealing with the new reality. So they would ask us to create workshops for them. They would ask for three hour workshops, say for older children, for one hour workshop for younger children. So it taught us to be flexible and adaptable as well. Um, Museums Without Borders is a program that is very dear to our heart because Collaboration is really at, at the heart of what we do at MAP. 
And when, and this was also a program that developed out of the pandemic because we realized that objects and people could not travel. So why don't we allow that, them to do that virtually? And so we approached museums across India, across the world. And the, what this, this uh, initiative does is it takes an object from the map collection and juxtaposes it with a work from the partner museum. And when you bring two objects in conversation, you get a very li lively dialogue that follows. And this was articulated by the curators from both the museums. So we began, I think, with the British Museum. And if you can see an example of that, that's um, our uh, modern contemporary work by Thayab Mehta from the map collection that was juxtaposed with um, a wonderful work by the miniaturist Nen Suk, which was in the British Museum collection. So you had this solitary drama of juxtaposed with this group of celebratory um, trumpeteers. And the theme that brought them together really was music. Um, the MAP Academy is the research wing of, of MAP. It's a completely online um, initiative, which, which is, consists of three parts. One is the encyclopedia that we are creating because we feel there really is no um, encyclopedia on Indian art that people can refer to. And so we're beginning in a small way with about 2000 entries and gradually building up on it. The second component of this is online courses, which are both short-term and long-term art courses that people can be completely free, which people can access. And the third component is tools and resources, because there is, it's not that there is no research available, but it's also scattered and so diverse. And so we try to pull this all together at a portal where someone who's researching can actually access it. And of course, how do you remain sustainable in a digital museum, because if you have a physical museum, then there are various ways of, of um, trying to be sustainable because you have gate tickets, you have a cafe, you have all sorts of ways that you can raise money. But how do you do this in a digital space? And so we decided to introduce the digital membership. So um, there are various kinds of digital memberships, but we thought that was a way of making the museum sustainable. Technology is, at, is, is very important to map because we feel that if we want to get young people into the museum, we have to speak the language of the digital native. So we're trying to do that without overwhelming the collection. And so we've introduced a whole series of holographic experiences. So where you can actually pull up, for example, if an object is not, um, is not on display, you can pull it up on the holo screen. You have the virtual gallery where you can pull up exhibitions that have been in the past. So all kinds of 3D holographic experiences and finally, I think we end with MAP Labs. MAP Labs is an initiative of MAP that lies at the intersection of art and technology. And we thought we're living in the tech capital of the country. So why don't we collaborate with tech, tech companies to try and create solutions for art? And so one of them that we did was this um, experience that we created, we collaborated with Accenture to create the 3D persona of M.F. Hussein, one of our great artists. So if you walk into the museum, you're actually able to chat with Hussein because um, Accenture has used uh, artificial intelligence to feed in a lot of information. And all this was based on research that was done on Hussein's interviews that he had done in the past. So we accessed a lot of information, fed that in, and you can actually, um, yeah. Let me just play a little bit of it for you to get an idea of what it's like. Hello there. Great to see you. <coughs> I am sure you are eager to know about me. Go ahead and ask me questions about my art or about my life. I would answer you to the best extent possible. I saw the painting in the gallery of Mother Teresa. Can you tell me more about it? For me, Mother Teresa is the ever presence of a mother. I first saw Mother Teresa at the Delhi in 1979. I immediately sketched her serene face, which she autographed, God bless you. I followed her on my paintings for the next two decades, as if she was my mother, Taylor. Um, sorry to interrupt, Kamini. Are we yeah. finished? Because we've yeah. run over yeah. time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was a kind Thank of you. point to map. That was very interesting. I didn't interrupt, but we have, you know, run over time. And now I'll give the floor to Dr. Chiara Rossanio for her presentation on uh, Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. I, I believe that's the presentation. Thank you.
First of all, I would like to thank you, Dr. Pande, and all the organizations that gave us the opportunity to share our experience in the production of the last software, uh, the Leonardo da Vinci masterpiece. Uh, I would like to uh, share our experience in the protection of the masterpiece of Leonardo. Uh, global environmental change is putting on danger our cultural heritage. And uh, in Italy, we are working hardly uh, to address urgently uh, new approaches and strategy to keep uh, safe uh, our cultural heritage and particularly the, the most fragile. And um, uh, there is a, a very, uh, this requires a lot of attention and out of uh, uh, energy because uh, global change is really impacting on the value of our cultural heritage and uh, uh, because uh, um, we are facing uh, very strong periods in our country. Uh, now we have uh, some uh, good results and uh, we know that uh, we need to work together starting from different discipline to face uh, the uh, challenge to protect our cultural heritage from the fact of the global changing. Uh, the Leonardo da Vinci masterpiece uh, is uh, one of the most important uh, a uh, fine art expression, not only in Italy, but uh, let me say all around the world. It's a, a, a heritage of humanity and uh, it's a part uh, of uh, the refectory in the convent of uh, Santa Maria delle Grazie uh, in Milan. Uh, here in that room, starting from 1494 to 1498, Leonardo da Vinci spent uh, more than four years painting the Last Supper uh, using uh, experimental techniques that uh, uh, this is a wall painting, this is not a fresco, and uh, uh, it's very fragile. Let me say that uh, uh, we will know that starting from 1517, it started to be damaged because of the techniques that uh, Leonardo decided to apply to have this painting. Because let me say, uh, fresco was no the correct uh, technique for Leonardo da Vinci, because he would like to uh, paint very really slowly and take a lot of time and a lot of attention in the drawing and uh, in the use of colors. That let me say that this kind of techniques and this kind to uh, mix the color is already known our nowadays as the sfumato leonardesco, the techniques that Leonardo da Vinci used to paint, to keep alive the figures and to have a results so impressive also nowadays. But this techniques is very fragile and that's the reason why I'm very thanks to you to share our experience to protect it because our experience could be um, a reference, um, a case of study for all people that are taking care of cultural heritage nowadays in the changing of climate because uh, we have a so fragile wall painting and in our experience, traditional approaches are not enough. 
we use to protect our heritage, working on the uh, temperature and the humidity inside the museum to protect our masterpiece. But unluckily, in our experience, we discovered that we need to improve our approaches we have to enlarge uh, people that is working inside the museum, uh, such as expert in chemistry, expert in uh, uh, the manage of uh, uh, the microbiology analysis and so on, because uh, the changing of the atmosphere, the changing of the uh, uh, environmental condition in which we can find our heritage uh, is so strong and required to us to change our point of view, to enlarge our approaches, and first of all, to work all together. And this is a, a good also uh, message to next generation, to work together starting from different disciplines to take care of our cultural heritage. And we can manage it with uh, good results. Let me say that uh, uh, starting from the last centuries, uh, during the last important, uh, let me notice it, uh, very strong intervention that was made by Pinin Brambilla Barcellon, a great women that uh, uh, she died some month ago and uh, let me say that she spends more than 20 years working on the masterpiece of Leonardo da Vinci taking care of it and uh, she, uh, she worked uh, for the first time in the history of the painting that has more than five century of history uh, for the first time with the support of our ministry, the ministry, Italian Ministry of Culture, and to remove all the layer that were added during the five centuries on the surface of the painting. And what we have nowadays is the the original so fragile layer uh, by Leonardo da Vinci. And that's the reason why they decided to protect the, uh, uh, the room, the refectory adopting an age back uh, starting from 1996. And let me say that was a very important decision because we can say that the, the uh, Le Leonardo da Vinci Museum is one of the most pure places uh, in Italy and we have no pollution, no dust, and we have the opportunity to maintain it in very good condition. But uh, what I had the opportunity to understand uh, um, when I was the director of the museum was that uh, we have daily to work to improve our knowledge to understand how to face the changing. Because, for example, at that time, a large number of visitors uh, come inside in the refectory uh, were a cause of the uh, opportunity for uh, gas and uh, pollution to enter inside the museum. For that reason, we started a new research program and we understood that we have to approach different, uh, uh, different uh, elements to protect it and uh, now we will know how to work and we have already applied the Leonardo da Vinci protocol in the Ro uh, Museum of uh, Galleria Borghese in Roma on the status of Apollo Daphne to protect it from the uh, climate change effect and from pollution and also in Milan, in a modern museum 
or the museum of uh, the 20th centuries where we have some important elements to protect. So let me say uh, shortly, because I would like to leave time for our important discussion that uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, uh, masterpiece give us the opportunity to understand that museums are also not only a place to improve a sense of community, a sense of uh, um, attachment to the expression of people, different cultures during the centuries, but that is also a place to explain that climate change and global changing is putting under danger of our heritage and we can work all together to face it. We can protect it and we uh, can have the opportunity also and the most fragile example as the last opera is to find a solution to work together to improve also uh, younger people to understand that they can change this trend they can uh, to decide to have uh, good uh, uh, relations and opportunity to good uh, uh, condition to live, to choose uh, how to live, also to be a part of the saving of our cultural heritage and uh, Leonardo da Vinci masterpiece. And uh, mm, I, uh, shortly, I would like to say that Together we can do it. This experience was very strong and nowadays we are working in new instruments to have a little museum all around the world to face this challenge together in the line of the experience of Leonardo and in its uh, heritage. So thank you so much for your kind of quest, uh, attention and for the opportunity to share our experience. Thank you, Kiara. That was a very fascinating presentation and also makes us realize that, you know, on one hand, how Kamini had shown that masters need to speak to the public, but at the same time, we also need to care for the original you know, art of the masters. And this really is, is a very detailed presentation. And mm -hmm. climate change definitely is one important aspect that uh, Indian museums have just started looking at it, you know, in, uh, and uh, you've already looked at it in, in very much detail and it requires time. Uh, we have a lot of questions and very little time. So what I'm going to do is sort of, uh, I've collated all the questions and I'm going to ask uh, um, each of the panelists to, uh, you know, respond to this. Uh, one general question which everyone has asked is what are the critical elements of a museum? So I think with respect to each of your museum, you can uh, speak about what you feel is the critical aspects, you know, of a, or, or elements of a museum and how have they changed in a 21st century museum? And there are also specific queries about, you know, can we, how much can we diversify linguistically? This was specifically for Deborah and Kamini to respond on, like for in communicating uh, in the museums. Uh, the challenges that all of your museums have faced in, you know, interpreting it during COVID times, you know, getting into digital. Uh, so that's something Kamini covered, but I'm sure each museum had its own way of, uh, you know, going digital. Uh, during the lockdown. So that is uh, another question. And um, lastly, you know, uh, yeah, the elements in 21st century. Also, uh, with respect to uh, Kamini, there was one question whether you are collaborating, whether MAP is collaborating with uh, Poland uh, on any aspect. And there was one for Kiara on how, what would you advise uh, museum goers, you know, to be aware of the collections um, when you're looking at these aspects of impact of climate change. So I hope you've noted the quick questions. I will first give the floor to Deborah, uh, then Javier, Kiara, and Kamini. So can we... Well, I, yeah. I, I think that we, um, we didn't actually uh, talk about all the different elements of a museum, 
Well, Kiara talked about conservation. So every, every museum has to have conservation <laughs> and collections management, all the operations that a normal museum would have, the library, archives, all of this, of course, we didn't mention, but it, it's very much a part of a museum. And uh, uh, I, I think that uh, the core of a museum really is to get people to reflect and connect with the, with the collections, to see that um, they, it should mean something to them and they should, under, they should be able to uh, connect personally with what they see and experience at a museum. So a language, language is tough in India because there are 14 major languages. Um, we do everything in English and Tamil, though in the Kerala section, we try to do something in, in Malayalam. Uh, we try to, to indicate the languages, but it's very difficult because people come from all over. Actually, less than 50% of our visitors are local and 50% are out of state and out of, out of the city. So that part is now, of course, not there with COVID. So um, it's not an easy, not an easy question. So we, we tried different things. We also have been doing online courses. Um, we try to do whatever we can online nowadays as well as physical. Okay. Thanks. Avi? Javier, would you take the question? Okay. I, I, I have a uh, question. What are the elements of a museum and especially in the 21st century, what do you feel are the critical elements of a museum? And you can take it uh, specifically for Prado, you know. Yes. Um, uh, first of all, I think the, the main function of a museum is to preserve the, the collections. Uh, we are the we have a heritage of uh, uh, great value and we are responsible, we have to, to be responsible enough to transmit to the generations uh, to, uh, for, for many, many years. Many. So uh, I, th I think this uh, continue uh, to, to be the, the main function, the main element of, of a museum. Uh, after that, the education, I think, is, is the, the other pillar of, of our task. The education allows uh, um, all kind of public to access uh, appropriately uh, to the um, treasures, uh, and to the information, and to, to the interpretation in, in, a, in a deep way. No? Um, so education has to be bear in mind the different the changes that uh, 20 cent 21 century uh, has uh, uh, has um, uh, provoked in our culture no so the necessity of inclusion uh, uh, the necessity of uh, of um, pay more attention of the works made by women even in historical uh, uh, the times and uh, so uh, complete in in this way the 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 real sense of education thanks thank you just a quick question another quick question for you which is you know how was uh, you know how did you face the challenge to show el greco uh, when displayed alongside modern masters Yes, it, it was really a, a challenge for us, for me especially. Initially, we selected the modern works um, considering their relation to El Greco's paintings, uh, but they were very, uh, very different between them. Uh, so the solution of four great panels, four huge panels, allowed uh, to unify the space of the second room and uh, um, provide a pattern very helpful to, to, to uh, keep the, the sense of unity. And when you uh, introduce yourself in, in every of the four circuits, uh, you can uh, see and, uh, and interpret it the, the varied uh, 
kind of different shapes, different uh, techniques, and different artists, very unsimilar in between amongst them. You know? So I think in this exhibition, the, the design of the space was really relevant. Thank you very much, Javier, for that elaboration. Uh, now to uh, Chiara, I think, you know, besides uh, uh, answering on what are the elements of a museum, there is the additional question about what you would advise museum goers. And also, do you have a team of chemistry experts uh, within the museum or is it just you're in planning stage? That's a query. Okay, let me say, uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank also Deborah and Javier for their um, uh, the, uh, the idea and their suggestion to me. And let me say that uh, uh, during this pandemic, uh, we uh, had a not easy, easy season in Italy. Now I'm talking to you, we are at the third uh, lockdown and the museum, cultural places, theater, and all the area and all the spaces of culture are closed almost from one year. And uh, we discovered the opportunity to anyway open the gate, open the door of the museum and let people to understand our work and uh, what we are doing daily to taking care of the, the uh, uh, heritage inside the museum. So uh, this is really important also because people now uh, have the opportunity to be a part of our challenge or of our work. We used to say the work behind the scenes of the museum, but now we love to share, to merge our daily experience. And let me say that uh, now, uh, we have, uh, in Italy, we have uh, the uh, Istituto Centrale del Restauro, that is uh, the uh, central in uh, institution of the research on restoration. And we have historically uh, uh, a department of chemistry that is working uh, near uh, museums to support analysis and so on. And now we are working in Milan, thanks to the director of the uh, direction of the National Museum in Lombardy, that is my land. Uh, we are working with the uh, University of Milano Bicocca, where there is specifically an area of uh, people that is working on the chemistry of the atmosphere. And now there is a strong third group that is working on the uh, chemistry of the indoor area of museums and cultural plates. And for us, it's very crucial also because uh, now we are trying to explain to people that, uh, of course, uh, museums are related to our history, but uh, museums are always related to our actual periods and to the future. And we are able to uh, support innovation in studies and also in the achievement of discipline applied on cultural heritage. Thank you. That was very well stated. So over to Kamini now for her views. Okay, let me very quickly go through because I, I laid out what I thought were the elements important in a museum of the future in my presentation. But I think what a fundamental responsibility of a museum is besides preserving the objects in its care is also to unlock the stories that these objects tell and to communicate to your audiences of the relevance of this, of this object to their current day lives. How does this object you know, connect with the life that I live today? And I think that's extremely important if we are to connect to the community because again, for a museum of future, you need to connect to the community and you need to uh, both the local community and the wider community. And that's why we see going forward map as a kind of hybrid. 
because we see the digital museum and the physical museum that we will open at the end of this year as really two parts of a whole. And both are equally important, both are complementary, and both are able, because the reach that a digital museum has is incredible. Um, we always hope that the physical museum will be equally important because um, the kind of relationship that a, that a person has with the artwork, we hope will always remain there. So what we're trying to develop is the hybrid model, which we think is the way forward. Okay, thank you, Kamini. So I think uh, each of you have answered, uh, you know, very well to the main elements of a museum and everyone agrees that collections, care for collections is very important, but at the same time, communication about the collection, the stories that need to be said with it, uh, and uh, how it is communicated in various languages, of course, one could try that, but also the digital component today in the hybrid museum, which is very important, and interpretation of, you know, the art itself while you are designing spaces, as uh, Javier has explained. So each of your presentations were really interesting and what brought in a different perspective to make us realize, you know, what are the key elements in a museum. Um, uh, truly speaking, you know, when, when it's a collections based museum, then that is the true value. And one really has to think of the digital technology as a tool and use it judiciously, you know, wherever it's enhancing the collection in that sense. Uh, but of course, today we, you know, there are themes and events, uh, and there may not be much collections in a museum, but they need to be communicated to the people. So that is another component, you know, that needs to be addressed. So I would say, you know, that each of your museum had a different perspective and context, and it really gave us a very good idea on uh, what are the challenges. So first, I think one would really need to understand what is your museum about? You know, what are the key messages, the mission and the vision of the museum? And probably that's where you balance your, you know, the collection care vis-a-vis uh, the communication and uh, uh, digital component. So uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's uh, quite interesting. I, I don't mind going in for more questions or even amongst the panelists if they want to respond, but I have to ask the organizers, do we have the time? I think it's what I'm seeing is a lot of appreciation and thank yous in the messages. So probably our one hour is over and there are other, uh, you know, sessions to be continued. So thank you very much for <laughs> one of you. I really enjoyed moderating this session with you. <laughs>